Today I'm in Buntingford in East Hertfordshire. I've always referred to Buntingford as a village, but after a lot of development in recent years, Buntingford has doubled in size, so now it's regarded as a small town. Situated on Ermine Street, an important Roman road, Buntingford soon evolved into an important staging post in the 18th century. Many of its high street buildings were coaching inns. Since the decline of horse-drawn coaches, many of them have now converted into shops or private houses. Near the village centre is St Peter's Church, which is the oldest brick-built Anglican church in the UK, dating from before 1620. St Peter's Church, not only is it the oldest brick-built Anglican church in Britain, but um, inside the church, on one of the south-facing walls, is a brass plaque which is listed in a book of Hertfordshire Curiosities. The plaque's about 35mm by 250mm and uh, it contains the finest engraving you have ever seen. Just the middle section of the plaque depicts an image of uh, the vicar who ran the church in the 1620s, Alexander Strange, preaching to his uh, congregation. And just that part of the, uh, the plaque, which is no bigger than your, mo your mobile phone, the detail on there is absolutely incredible. And uh, look at this picture and uh, to think this was done over 400 years ago. Unbelievable. I'm starting my walk from Church Street, which is situated halfway up the High Street. The Fox and Duck pub at the bottom of Church Street is a very popular inn, and it often gets quite busy. Opposite the pub, beside the river, is an 18th century one-cell prison, known as the Cage. I'm crossing the bridge here and this brings me onto a lane known as the Causeway. The Causeway goes up a hill for about half a mile and brings you to what used to be the parish of Layston. In 1931 over 700 people were recorded as living here, 
but in the coming years most of them migrated down the hill to Buntingford which had all the shops and up until the 1960s a railway station. Layston's church, St Bartholomew's, fell into disuse as a result and lay derelict for many decades, but in recent years it was sold by the Church of England and turned into a private residence. The famous 18th century gunsmith Robert Wogden is buried in the chancel inside the church. After the Buntingford Railway was shut down in the 60s, the railway sleepers were torn up and used to line the path beside the church. I'm taking the footpath near the church and heading out into open country. There are several footpaths crossing the countryside here and I check my map to make sure that I take the right ones. I'm using the Ordnance Survey map which covers this area of the county. At the end of that footpath I turn left and head up the hill. I need to head east to get to my next stop, the village of Hare Street. Well, I've come to the top of the path and I can go three ways now, left, right or straight ahead. Um, if I go right it brings me out onto the road and I'm going to try and avoid using the roads as much as possible, so I'm going straight ahead across that field. Once I'm across the field, uh, the footpath takes you through this wooded area and uh, unfortunately because of all the rain we've had, it's a little bit muddy at the moment, so I've got to watch my step. Once I'm through the wood, I'm back into open country. The path then takes me downhill towards Hare Street. The path brings me out onto a road that leads into the village. The village pub is called the Beehive, it's quite a nice pub. I've been here several times during my travels. I'm taking the turning directly opposite the pub. This road will take me to Great Hormead, which is only about half a mile away.
Great Hormead is a quiet little village that sadly doesn't seem to have any interesting history attached to it. However, it does have a nice thatched pub, which hardly ever seems to be open. Directly opposite the pub is Anderson's Lane, and that's where I'm heading next. When you get to the top of this lane, uh, just under the tree here in front of me or behind me, is something quite sobering. This is a memorial to a young American airman who died on the 11th of February 1944 when his P-47 Republic plane crashed here. And the uh, young lad was only about uh, 24 years old. How sad. What a brave lad. I'm staying on this lane for this stage of the walk, as very few vehicles ever use it. This lane, however, is a very long one and goes on for a couple of miles, but it's easier than using muddy footpaths. About a mile and a half along this lane you come to an old farm called Flint Hall which now seems to be owned by a company called Stagestruck who, from what I've read online, seem to be involved in big TV and stage productions. Fancy that being based right out here in the middle of nowhere. As we get near to the end of the lane we come into the parish of Anstey, my next destination. Oh, that was a long old lane, but I uh, reached the end of it and I come to a T-junction. And uh, I'm now in the parish of Anstey, but to get to the village I need to turn right. So about time somebody cleaned that sign. Can barely read it. <laughs> Hope the pub's open. In the early 20th century, a noted academic who wrote a book about the village reckons that anyone anywhere in the world with the surname Anstey should be able to trace their family surname history right back to this very village. How amazing is that? As we come into the village we pass St George's Church which has the stories I want to focus on but first I need a drink. Oh, we're coming into the main part of the village now. Oh, and I can see the pub. Well, thankfully the pub's open. Boy, do I need this. Anyway, this pub is called the Blind Fiddler. Although it's only been known as the Blind Fiddler for the past 20 odd years. Before that, it was called the Checkers Pub. And how it got its name, the Blind Fiddler, is all down to a local folk story um, from way back here in the village. Uh, there used to be a, a blind man called Blind George and he used to play a violin and one day he disappeared, nobody saw him again and it's believed that he went exploring a tunnel or an underground passage underneath the village uh, and as he entered the tunnel he was playing his violin and um, it's said that the people up in the village could actually hear the sound of the violin from up here um, and then all of a sudden they heard a blood-curdling scream and then it all went silent 
and Blind George was never seen again. So uh, you can really pick holes in a story like that, you know. I mean, why, why would a blind man be exploring a tunnel? But uh, never mind it. Here's to Blind George. Dribbling. Boy, did I need that beer. Oh, I could have done with another one, to be quite honest, but I don't want to get drunk. Um, anyway, this walk's taking longer than I thought, actually. I've done about 15 miles, and I'm only halfway. So, well, after I've been to the church, I've got to walk back. <laughs> anyway, off to the church. I want to show you something very interesting. As you come through the lich gate of St George's Church you've got this closet that is in fact the village lockup or prison and uh, apparently it was last used in 1914 St George's Church is pretty much like any other church you'll find in any other town or village anywhere in England. And this one dates from about the 12th century. But this church has got something different. And it's just over here. The church font in St George's dates from the Norman period and is engraved with the images of four mermen, the rarest of pagan symbols, making this font one of the rarest in Britain. Mermen are believed to be the rarest of all the pagan symbols and the mermen here on this font are depicted holding their tails and they believe it's to give the appearance of a boat or a ship and that in itself is thought to represent the Ark of Christ. But um, this church font here is just about the rarest in Britain. And I've touched it. That is incredible. For the next piece of interesting history, we're going to take a walk round the back of the church and through the gate. When you come out of the back of the church through the gate you've got what appears to be a large pond only it's not a pond the pond is actually a moat surrounding a huge castle mound this used to be Anstey Castle built in the 12th century by the de Anstey family Nicholas de Anstey was a fierce opponent of King John and in the run-up to the First Barons' War in 1215 he set about reinforcing the castle with extra defences.
When the First Baron War ended in 1216, King John ordered Nicholas de Anstey to destroy all of the defences that he'd built in the run-up to the war and the castle had to be reverted back to its original condition and it's believed that all the rubble from that demolition was used to help build the church. When Nicholas de Anstey died in 1225 the castle passed down to his young daughter who was only a minor at the time. King John seized the castle from Nicholas's daughter and then it passed into the ownership of the Bishop of Canterbury and from then on it was never known as a castle, only a manor house. But the village nearly got wiped off the map during World War II. The actual location of the village is only a couple of hundred yards from the end of the runway of what used to be RAF Nuthampstead, which started out as an RAF base during World War II, but passed into the hands of the Americans when they came into the war. In 1944, a B-17 bomber fully laden with bombs set off on a mission to bomb Cologne in Germany and it had barely just taken off when it ran into problems and it began losing height. It descended towards the village and it missed the church literally by yards and unfortunately it slammed right into the castle mound. Sadly all the crew were killed but miraculously none of the bombs exploded. If that had happened the church, most of the village would have been destroyed. It's amazing. Keep quiet in there. I'm setting off now for the long walk back to Buntingford. Oh, I've reached that junction on the road. I came down that lane there and uh, is that dirty signpost. But uh, I'm going back that way. Well, I've reached the bottom of the lane and I've come to the B1368 and I turn a left here, I head towards Hare Street where I was earlier but I don't want to go that far. Somewhere down here on the right there should be a footpath that will take me up over the hill somewhere. Right. Well I've only gone 100 yards and there's the footpath and uh, takes me up there. I'm um, following the footpath signs on the way back and uh, hopefully going this way it, it'll cut about two or three miles off the journey. Uh, still got a way to go. Heading into the jungle here. Bit overgrown. This is a problem that we tend to face occasionally on our walks poorly maintained footpaths. 
other landowners are supposed to maintain them and uh, a lot of them just don't bother. You really need a machete to get through some of them. Oh, I think we're nearly at the end. Oh. I've come off the footpaths. Um, they, a lot of them seem to be overgrown and uh, some of them are quite muddy from the rain we've had. So I'm sidetracking. I've come into the village of Widdiel, uh, which is just up the lane from Buntingford. And uh, hopefully, uh, not long now, I should be back into Buntingford. Oh, I can see Buntingford over there in the distance. I've got a choice here. I can stick to the lane. Well, there's a very well-maintained footpath. I think that'll save me about half a mile. Yep, take the footpath. Ouch. Oh, well, I've just come down this path and uh, that's the lane. It saved me a, a few hundred yards, but anyway. <sighs> Now I'm back out on the lane and uh, I'm getting very, very close to Buntingford now. Oh, can't wait. I tell you, it's been a long walk and I'm feeling it, really am. Oh, there's a footpath here and uh, that footpath takes us up to Layston Church, which is uh, the church we stopped at on our way out of Buntingford earlier on and uh, anyway I don't want to go uphill I'd rather stay walking downhill uh, Buntingford should be just around the bend somewhere nearly there uh, they're cutting the grass verges what a pity they can't do the footpaths Well, I finally made it back to Buntingford. I've been walking for five and three quarter hours and I've done about 25 to 27 miles. By God, am I feeling it. Anyway, hope you enjoyed that and I'll see you next time. I need a drink. Pub time.